Okay, hello everyone and thank you to being here. I know that some of you are in a long journey. This is the five, the fifth day or conference since the first time to now. So I feel the pressure and hold and how tired you should feel today. But thank you to, for being here. I'm Gianluca Arbezzano and I work as a site reliability engineer. And if you know where you are, you are in, the, in my talk and I will speak about the infrastructure as a code, but um, in a little bit, in a very different way, because uh, during, during the last year uh, working as a SRE, one of the things that we are doing at Influx Data is trying to be less YAML or JSON engineer. So that's why, why I'm so happy when I heard about the YAML camp, because for me it was a chance to explain uh, how we are trying to make it a little bit more fun for us. So, oops. Okay, so a little bit about myself. Uh, I have a blog that I try to keep up to date and I write with, with a good rate. So, and I'm a, I'm a Twitter guy. So if you're a Twitter guy too, just follow me. And I also share photos of my two cats time to time, so I'm a real Twitter guy. Other than that, I like to write code and hacks that looks really great. Sometimes I succeed, sometimes not that much, but that's what I do. I grow my vegetables, so uh, I have a garden, and I like to travel for fun and work, so that's why I'm here. I also like to cook, so I come from Italy. So this is me making gnocchi, homemade gnocchi in Dublin a few years ago when I was used to live there. And this is me in Palm Spring uh, during the company All Hands just uh, two days ago. And this looks, uh, really looks like a parody, paradise. I was so happy, all the company was together, it was having fun. Um, but in my mind, YAML and JSON is always behind the corner. So you never know when you're gonna do a Kubernetes deploy or when you're gonna write or, or read some YAML stuff, um, some Hansible recipes. Luckily we don't use Hansible, so uh, but it's always behind the corner. So this is me in Cuba last year uh, during my first horse trip. So you can see how the horse is small because I, it's my, it was my first ride. Uh, so they give me a really uh, quiet one. Um, but let's come with me to, merge, to my journey uh, at Influx Data uh, as a SRE and working at infrastructure as a code. So for who doesn't know what Influx Data is, uh, is the company is a startup uh, behind InfluxDB and uh, all the other tools. So if you go on GitHub slash Influx Data, there is a bunch of open source repository. And if you hook all of them together, you can build a monitoring system. So the famous one, the most famous one is InfluxDB, that it's a time series database, it's in Go, and uh, it's really easy to start and you can point all your time series metrics that comes from your application or from your system to the database. You can query them, aggregate them, and do a bunch of other stuff. Obviously this, is what, this, is, this was not enough, so we created a Telegraph, that it's an open source collector, like CollectD or something like that, but um, it has more than 200 input plugins and more than, I, I don't know how many of them, how many, but a lot of output plugins. So it doesn't work just for InfluxDB. You can configure Telegraph in your system to scrape Prometheus metrics or to get MySQL metrics, or you can at least, you can watch the Docker um, socket and get metrics and you can store metrics uh, in a lot of places like the InfluxDB obviously, but also Telegraph, CloudWatch, and this kind of stuff. So it's very powerful because you can grab metrics from CloudWatch and push them to InfluxDB or grab metrics from source and push them out. So it's open source and just have a look. The other one is Chronograph. It is the UI that we are building to hook all this stuff together. But uh, Grafana also supports uh, InfluxDB as a input source. So if you have that, you can just try. Capacitor is a, a proactive monitoring uh, and analysis tool because we know that uh, in some way we need to use the metrics and a lot of people use capacitor to do alerting, but it's a lot more capable. So you can do, you can apply machine learning on the streams or batch of data and other stuff. So if you need to get paged by the 
amount of CPU and RAM that you are using, you can use capacitor. And I think that's it. Give it a try. So, um, when I knew that I was in the YAML track, I, I thought that I was gonna say that. I'm not against YAML or JSON. I use them and I'm happy. Uh, it, they tend to become unmaintainable. They're very, very, very long um, quickly. So that's what I don't like about this approach. But we use them and I will try to explain, to explain you how to identify when JSON and YAML are good and when they can become a troublemaker. I need to make a few assumptions here. Uh, at Influx Data, we are all, all uh, Go developer, and who is not strong with Go st is still able to read and write um, something in Go. And we embraced cloud, so we use AWS. We always did that since the beginning of our journey because the company is like 60 years old, so it's not very long. I don't have a very historical background as the previous talk, but we still have a little bit of history. So uh, all, all the examples that I'm gonna show are in Go, because that's my background, but I'm gonna explain and tell you that you can do this kind of stuff with every languages that um, you know there is an SDK for, or it really depends on what services you are using. So in my case, I'm using AWS and Kubernetes, and both of them has a really big set of SDK that you can use, so it's very easy to find the one that um, speaks your la the language that you know most. So I'm gonna explain you what I mean with, I think about uh, automation. So there are a couple of stuff. Uh, the first one is the ability to, pl to play and replay uh, tasks, and they, be, they, they need to be replayed in the same way, so they need to be then potent. Um, we can build pipelines, so we can hook together tools and procedures and you just have a button or a way to start them. And one of the big goals that we have when we think about operation is UX. So it's very important for us to have a user experience that has sense. So for us, a bunch of random scripts uh, and you know, bash in a repository is not what I, what I mean when I think about user experience. We use we leverage Kubernetes a lot, so we also extend it a lot, in a lot of time, in a, in a lot of ways. Uh, we have Q, uh, Kubernetes plugins, we use custom resource definition, so everything that matters in an operation, from an operational perspective in some way goes integrated um, in Kubernetes because Kubernetes gives us authentication authorization model and all this kind of stuff. So for, for us, it's really important that the user experience for operation is good as the one that you are building for your customer when you do a pretty UI or whatever. Obviously for us it's not the same, we don't use UI that much, so it means having a good CLI and having good documentation, but it's still a goal that we are achieving every day. I try to answer a bunch of questions. One is why Kubernetes is so powerful and complex and how and why how many people are onboarding and are trying to to use it. The second question is about AWS. How, how much, why AWS is so expensive and why a lot of people still use AWS? So I think the answer is common for both of these projects. Um, but what do, you, what do we do to um, you know, solve this kind of, uh, how, how, what do we do to embrace Kubernetes and embrace AWS in order to say, okay, it's, it's expensive, it costs a lot, it, it requires a bunch of time, time, but it's still valuable for me. I see a lot of people that to justify the AWS costs, they go to the console and they click around like crazy people and they do stuff like start the situ, create VPC, subnet, whatever. This is obviously not cost, uh, you know, not what I, it's not what I mean, it's very far from what I mean when I think about automation. This is not reproducible, this is not trackable, so nobody knows what's going on. So this is not the way that you justify the AWS cost. And this is not the way that I think we should justify the Kubernetes um, complexity. This is Han, oh, this is, I don't remember, no, no, this is Hansible, maybe, I don't know. Somebody can help me? 
I don't really know. <laughs> this is hell, so. Um, I don't think that this is the way that we should uh, justify the complexity or hide the complexity behind Kubernetes, because this is complex by itself. I mean, this is a template engine with some graphs and you know, recursion and whatever, so it's not really what I think about uh, maintainable infrastructure as a code. And this, for me, is also really pain. Uh, it's a real pain to write. So I, I don't really like it, but um, I think that to, justif to justify the cost for AWS and for Kubernetes and for whatever other services you are using, the secret is in their API. Kubernetes, it's so used because it's easy to integrate with. There are, specific, there are integration of, of the Kubernetes API for every cloud provider, and you can extend it in a very easy way, in injecting your code and managing your workflow. So that's what makes Kubernetes good. And that's why it's so complex, because it needs to handle all this flexibility. Same for AWS. AWS is obviously expensive, but it provides you API to do almost whatever you want with your servers. And having the freedom to do whatever you want means that you can take the flow for, from your team or from yourself and make it friendly for you. So you are, what, what I'm trying to do, what we try to do every day is not to, uh, you know, go to take the tools and apply and, you know, try to force ourse ourselves to use the tools in the way they drive us, but it's the opposite. We drive the tools, so we leverage them to do, to, to have what we want. What do I mean with code? Obviously, you probably got that I don't mean YAML and JSON, but what it means code for me in infrastructure. In my case, as I said, we are Go developers, so code for me means Go. And I don't mean Go like all the languages, I mean a subset of it, so we use variables, specs, types. We don't really use uh, condition, we don't really, we don't really use um, you know, for each loops or whatever. And we don't, the unique way to enforce us to write good code is requiring infrastructure has a code code uh, is to make a good code review, so being strict and looking at the complexity that somebody is injecting. If we see that the specification for our um, infrastructure becomes too complex, we usually reject the, the, the pull request or we work to make it easier and more linear. So if you think about what we have, you can think about what you got with the YAML, but we use Go. And in order to use Go, uh, we use, for example, for, for Kubernetes, we, we use the client Go SDK that Kubernetes provides, and other than describing all the resources as AML, we describe them using the actual struct that the SDK provides. I have some code about it. As I, tell, as I told you at the beginning, one of the things that you know, we we thought a lot about is when YAML and JSON are feasible and when they are not. We started to do that because we, we deployed a Kubernetes cluster and we started to copy paste YAML and you know, everything was fine and we were we was able to apply them, change them and whatever. But at some point we got some requirements and we was looking to be more dynamic. So for example, we had a requirement was we need a way to dynamically provision environment based on an API request. So we have a good set of end-to-end um, -end tests and the end-to-end -end tests need to run on a fresh environment. So we need a way to say in a, in a programmatic way, uh, create my environment that looks like this one and you know, at some point terminate it and so on. We started to do that, so we, what, how do you do that? You start to copy paste your YAML, you put it in your application, in your HTTP, client, in HTTP server, and you modify it, you maybe add some template engine because you need to change the image ID or you need to change the limit and so on. So this YAML file becomes a really creepy one and the application that manages that becomes impossible to test and hard to understand. And it's also not in line with the actual environment because you copy paste the YAML and it's very hard to require to an engineer to do the same work both 
So they need to change the ML in the production environment and they need to change the ML in the application that creates the dynamic environment. So this is the problem that we had. And thinking more about that, we realized that there are very two different type of resources. And when I mean resources, I don't mean just Kubernetes resources. So I don't mean pods or services or cron job or jobs. I mean everything that you can describe as a code. So we, as I said before, we use Kubernetes and AWS. So everything that matters to Kubernetes are resources, but also everything that um, matters on AWS are resources. So subnet, VPC, um, AC2, auto-scaling group, root 53 DNS record, everything is a resource. And we have two distinct categories for them. One is the short TTL one, what we call short TTL one, and one that we call long TTL one. So the long TTL one are usually stuff that doesn't change or doesn't change that often, and they are self-contained. Uh, so there is, there is no external agent that requires them to change. So when I think about a very easy one to understand is a VPC and a subnet. They don't really change that much because if you need to change the subnet ID, you need to remove all the servers from there and you need to replace them and move them to another subnet. So they can change, but it's not, more, it's not a, chain, a change. You usually remove all the ACQ and you, and you remove the subnet. So it doesn't change that much. More than that, what, what really changes is the AC2 because AC2 changes all the time. We do immutable infrastructure, I'm gonna speak about that later. Um, pod for us have a short ETL because they are containers, they come and go really fast. And we moved, we, we saw that the resources won't stay in the same category forever. For example, when we started, the auto scaling group on AWS was a um, uh, long time to leave resources because they was, they was there forever with the AC2, that uh, part of the cluster. But recently we moved them to be a short TTL because we need more because they need to be more dynamic and we use them a lot more. I'm gonna explain you why. But that's, that's the picture that we have in our mind when we think about infrastructure as a code. Is it a short time to leave resources? Is that a long time to leave? And you need to answer that question. This is one of my colleagues, Leonardo. Uh, he is a YAML engineer too, and you can see him approaching a really long Kubernetes uh, YAML file. So this is what we, we, are, try we are trying to, av to avoid every day moving forward. One of the pro about YAML when I, when I speak with people about um, what, what we do and how we, we try to do stuff is that YAML is not a programming language, and the people that do infrastructure as a code are not usually developer, so they can use a programming language. That's, that's really our case. I mean, every time that I do YAML, I need to open uh, the Kubernetes documentation, or when I use CloudFormation, I need to open the uh, AWS documentation to look at the syntax, to look at the field, to look how the, how the variable works, the type, or whatever. So I don't really think that there is uh, less complexity in how infrastructure as a code is made in YAML and JSON compared with um, what we can do with a proper language. Obviously, you need to be careful, as I said before, you can't really think about that as a real program, so we don't, we don't use if, loops, or whatever that much. Uh, but, you know, if you, do, if, you try, if, you, if you have a good compromise, it, it works, even for people that doesn't work with the programming language that you're using. In Go, in our case, Go is a compiled language so we, we saw a really big change when we started to write specification using Go because we had the editor telling us when we was using a field that wasn't supposed to be used because the code wasn't compiling. So that, that's a good stuff that you get for free. And uh, if you are not using a compiled language, it's still something that is gonna happen, it's gonna fail when you interpret the language. So if you use Python, when you run your specification, it will say, oh, this, this object doesn't have the field whatever, so um, it's something that you, know, you catch before applying the actual code to production or to whatever environment you have. And or, more than that, AWS and Kubernetes, I, I use AWS and Kubernetes as has a, has a main example because this is what I use, but um, usually the SDK also have 
all the objects and all the object has the field and the field has the documentation inside. So you mean that you can jump into the definition of the resource and you can see the inline documentation without opening uh, actual web browser. So I'm a Vim guy, so I'm, I'm happy when I can stay in Vim without moving so far from my terminal. Another stuff that you get for free, because you are using code, is the ability to write, to write utils. So this is, a, this is what a, a friendly API that we wrote to do transformation on uh, our Kubernetes resources. So I'm creating a list of Kubernetes stuff. So I'm deploying, let, this is a, let's say that I'm, de I'm deploying a new um, application and my application needs ATCD, so I take the ATCD specification and I add it in my list. I create the, mon the internal monitor, we use InfluxDB, so we create InfluxDB, capacitor, and all this kind of stuff, and we create the Kafka specification. So HAPS contains the, what you usually see has the list of YAML specification, but it's in Go. So you, we can reuse them. Obviously, to reuse them, based on the environment that you're going to create, you have different needs. Probably you have different version of the images, or maybe you have different container limits because the environment is different, so you don't have the same RAM on the same CPU. So we put together this framework to do transformation. So you, as you did the list of resources, you do the list, a list of operations that you apply on the, on the list of resources to change them in some way. So the first uh, operation that we are doing is the one that removes limits. So in this case, all the, all the resources that we are going to deploy doesn't have any Kubernetes limits. Um, the, we set the replication to one, so every pod will be replicated only one time. And with replicas is another function that allow us to change the number of replicas for a particular resource based on the name of the resource itself. So in this case, I'm increasing the number of ATCD to three. Obviously, this is an example, but this is a, a copy paste that I made from the code that we run. So that's how it works. With no affinity and we know the ports because we don't need any ports. Um, so you apply a transformation and you get uh, you know, the, the, the new object that you are supposed to deploy to production. You can even transform that to YAML and generate what you are comfortable to. Um, but that's how we use stuff. We don't, we don't use kubectl that much because we use the, the, when we have this list of objects, we just use the, the uh, client go to apply them to a target cluster. So this is how it works. You can also write test. And when I think about test, I don't mean the same test that, that we usually write for applications, so I don't look for assertion, so I don't, I don't look for matching all the generated Go code because it would be a mess, but for me it's a way to enforce something that really matters. So let's say that I, I know that after a bunch of transformation, the specification that I need, so what, need to what I need to deploy, uh, should contain ATCD. So what I can do is I can write a test that checks for ATCD to be in the specification. Or let's say that I need four Kafka. Um, I can check that the replication in the spec says that there are four Kafka. This is obviously a way to make assertion as you do in unit tests, but this is also a way to tell somebody else in the future that if you change that particular um, piece of the specification, you need to be aware and you need to be, sh to be sure about what you are doing. So the test will fail and maybe they will fail with a friendly uh, you know, uh, check that we say, okay, check for this documentation to see, to understand if you're, good or if you're doing something with all the knowledge you, have, you need or not. This is an example of how we, uh, about the transformation framework. So this is one of the functions that we saw before. And as you can see, it, return, it returns the operation itself. So in this way, we can chain together um, operation as you saw before. It's like you create a list of operations and all of them got applied to the list of resources. So in this case, is the with replicas. So it's the one that we saw before where you can specify the name um, of the resource and the amount of replicas that it should have. So we cycle over all the objects in the, in the specification. We look for the one that is a stateful set. Obviously, if you need to change more, you can add deployment or whatever you need. And uh, 
if the service name matches with the one in the array, we change the number of replicas. This is our code. This can be tested. This can, this can be modified. So it's an utility that we are able to, to write because we use real code. We use a lot of pipelines too. That's, obviously, we have Jenkins, but you can do that with whatever you want. As I told you, we've, we, you can write tests because now you have code and you can use those tests to enforce that a change to the infrastructure, um, that you need to be aware of something when you change the infrastructure. So every time some, somebody opens up a request to change uh, the, the specification, the CI runs and if the test fails, they, you know, they can't merge that, so the code won't be deployed to production. When somebody, when, when we get all the code review, so we double check that the code is right, that it's not too complex, it doesn't contain too much tricky stuff that developers are used to do, but ops, not that much. Um, you know, if it's ready and compliant, it gets merged, and there is a CI step that will deploy that to the target cluster. Pipeline gives us a, a, a easy to monitor sy system because every time we deploy something, Jenkins notify that and we can track the changes in our infrastructure. It gives us something that we can reproduce. So it's one of the goals for the automation that I speak about at the beginning. It's easy to extend as it's also a documentation kind of utility because when you write a, a Pipeline in Jenkins, it it's, has a code, so you can you can describe it. You can have a, uh, you can have an idea, and when somebody joins the company, you can just say, okay, let's go over together with the Jen with the Jenkins pipeline, and they will understand how we deploy the code. So it's it's a good documentation too. We started to write a lot more application that manage the short TTL side of our infrastructure. So as I said, the long one, they will stay as they are, they don't change it often, so we use JSON and CloudFormation for, the, for, the, for AWS and YAML for Kubernetes. But for the short ETL stuff, uh, we use Go and we write applications. So in our case, Kubernetes offers us uh, a really broad set of functions that we can use to interact with the cluster. So in this example, I'm going to show you something we wrote to resolve a really tiny problem of automation that wasn't solved by uh, any you know, tools. This is how we solve that. There are plenty of, of ways to do it. But the problem is Kubernetes supports uh, label. So you can create complex topology of the cluster labeling your nodes and say, this pod can go only in the node that is tagged with the CI, with the role equals CI, or with the role equals public. And other than that, there is another piece, because if you label them, you can distribute pods. But um, with taint, that is another concept that works kind, kind of like labels, you can say, OK, um, this node is able to accept pods that has the role equals CI lab, um, label but only them. So if you get one that is role equal CI, it won't get accepted by the, uh, the node in the cluster. So in this way, you can create isolation and complex topologies. <clears throat> when you use AWS autoscaling group, I don't know if you know what they are, but in, in short, uh, you ask AWS to create, to take care about the number of AC2 that you have. So you can create, you can say, give me 10 AC2 T2 medium in a specific region with this user data and this kind of stuff. Um, so you say that, and one of the features is you can set labels to the autoscaling group, and you can, you can say this label needs to be pushed down to the AC2 that you, that you create, so that it creates. So that, that's it. Well, what we do uh, with Kubernetes is we, we wrote a tiny application that uses a shared informer. A shared informer in Kubernetes is an object that, that you can help you to watch for particular events. Kubernetes is all event-based, so in, in our case, we look for the event triggered when a new node joins the cluster. 
A new node joins the cluster when the auto scaling group creates the AC2. So, what happened when, um, when the auto scaling group creates the AC2? It's now pretty easy. So, an auto scaling group creates the, the node, the node joins the cluster, our application catches the event, and in the event, we um, look for the, AC2, for, the ta for the tag of the AC2. And if they match a particular um, syntax, they get translated to kubelet uh, label or kubelet tains. So this is how it works. If our AC2 has a tag, Kubernetes slash AWS labeler label equals um, role equals CI, it gets translated as a Kubernetes label that looks like AWS labeler dot data dot cloud slash load equals CI. It means that when we declare a pod, uh, we can say this pod can go in the row CI bit. Same for things, just a different syntax. So this is how, how we solve an automation problem that we had using Go. As I, as I told you, some stuff doesn't, doesn't really, uh, don't really require something like that, so we use more traditional tools. Right now for security group, VPC, root 53 zones, not the actual record, but the, the zone itself. Uh, root 53 is the DNS, so the DNS zone is managed by CloudFormation, the record that are managed by Kubernetes, um, or for MEI, so policies and users. We use CloudFormation because it's a framework that works. We write a specification in JSON, we push that, to, cloud, to AWS, we see what's the plan it for our changes, and we apply the change if we like it, using the pipeline as well. There is a lot, a lot to do in this area. Uh, in our case, the master are the Kubernetes master are still manually made because we are moving fast, so we need to think about how to solve the issue. But for now, they are manually provisioned. We will get there at some point. Uh, so there, there is stuff that we should do. What I'm, what I'm sharing is something that we went over to all the year, and we are now trying to understand if it, if it had sense. So the auto scaling, as I told you, the auto scaling gr uh, group. It, it's a nice story about how uh, a resource moves between category. When we started our journey with Kubernetes. We didn't really need a lot of the, uh, I mean, I know, uh, we didn't change a lot of the number of nodes or this kind of stuff. So auto scaling for us was pretty stable. So they was in the long time to leave side of the um, category. But moving forward, they become more like a dynamic and short TTL situation because we need more, uh, to, we need more auto scaling group. We need different auto scaling group because different auto scaling group has different tags so more auto scaling group we create more complex the um, all the topology of the cluster can be so uh, every style every color every group of color here represent an auto scaling group so we can create infinite of them to have dedicated area of the cluster and we, we, we leverage the same stuff when we, do, when we need to do Kubernetes update. We deploy a new auto scaling group with the, that manages the new uh, version of Kubernetes. And when we are happy with the new version, we delete the previous one and we roll out the change in this way. So we also use that as a powerful um, rolling update for Kubernetes version. And in general, for every update that doesn't you know, in the, in, in the image itself. <clears throat> oh, this is, this is something that I told you before. So another way that, um, another set of stuff that we do to decrease the number of uh, configuration management tools that we need to handle, and I'm happy to say that we don't use Chef, Ansible, Puppet, or whatever, um, is using immutable infrastructure and user data. User data across cloud is the, is the concept that uh, you know, helps you to 
write a bash script or depending on, on the MEI, on the OS that you're using, it can be a different kind of stuff, but it's a way to download files, create new directories, and you know, make some bootstrapping of your AC2. Every time a new server starts, it executes the user data to configure whatever you need. And immutable infrastructure, I, I think it's pretty clear, uh, but I'm gonna just tell you some of the main topics. So, your AC2, your servers goes away really fast, and that's fine. And when you approach an update for the operating system, or for um, some version of the binaries that are in the image, you don't connect to the server to change it, but you destroy the server and you replace the server with a new version of the um, kernel or the new version of the binaries that you need. So you never update something that runs, you replace it. This is what immutable infrastructure means. Um, Having two, these two different layers helped us to remove the configuration management tools because we use packet, the HashiCorp packet or Linux kit to build our MEI with everything we need inside and we use the user data to join the Kubernetes cluster, uh, the new node to the Kubernetes cluster. So I don't see the point about using the config management at this point. I'm cheating because the, we use CoreOS and CoreOS has, Core has a user data support ignition and ignition is a JSON file. But as I told you, I like JSON, I don't like long unmaintainable JSON. And our JSON is pretty straightforward and short because it just uh, downloads a, a file from the CI from Amazon, it creates a bunch of directories, it makes some systemd units up. And that's it, so nothing really uh, crazy. <clears throat> a side effect that you get when you do immutable infrastructure or when you have short TTL resources that change frequently is that you have more secure because if somebody you know, hacked the servers or whatever, if you change them really frequently, the leak is gonna go away. Obviously, you still need to understand where you get in, but the idea is that changing them um, will still make the their life a little bit harder, so it will make our system a little bit more secure. So I think we are almost there, so it's time to wrap up. I said a lot, so I hope you're gonna, you know, stop me, I don't have a lot of time because I need to travel back, but you know where, where to find me. So let me know what you think. JSON and YAML are not the problem, is how you use them that can be a problem. So we spoke about long TTL and short TTL. So think about, if you, if you are going with the, in, in the same journey that we had, think about how many long TTL and short TTL resources you have. If you have a lot that looks like short, YAML probably is the troublemaker and your life will become a lot better. Oops. Use the API. Every service that you use has them. Amazon, Kubernetes, PagerDuty, um, your MailChimp server, um, whatever. Probably also your expense uh, application has them. Use them because that's the value that we get these days from all these SaaS offering. Their API. We are not, they don't do the tools to enforce us to use them in the way they think. They give us the API to, to leave us freedom to implement our way to work, our way to think, and obviously not just us, but for all our team. When you start to use code, you get all the, all the capabilities that code gives you, so you have the ability to write uh, a framework to make transformation, as I told you, or you can write a unit test and you can have them in a pipeline that helps you to make your infrastructure as a code solid. And you have you know, all the code review stuff, so if you, we, do, we, we use GitHub, so everything that needs to be deployed will go through a review process and a pull request and a merge, so it's kind of stable. And think about the immutable infrastructure because it makes everything, you know, it, all, if, you, if you take all this stuff and you put them together, it's when you start to see the light 
uh, at the end of the tunnel. So it's a long journey. It took us more than a year, but I think we are kind of happy. At least we don't write a lot, a lot of EML anymore. And uh, I put together some of the links about what I write, what I read, and uh, so feel free to use them. I'm going to share the slides in some way. Any questions? Thank you.